The last video for chapters 8 and 9 is going to take a look at um, the different types of bonds and how electronegativity plays a role and what types of bonds form. And we're also going to look at the energies associated with the forming of bonds as well as the breaking of bonds. So this slide shows you um, what the differences are between polar and nonpolar covalent bonds as well as an ionic bond. With both covalent bonds, an electron pair is being shared, at least one pair. Um, in a nonpolar covalent bond, letter A, they're being shared evenly, so you see the symmetrical oval. Whereas in a polar covalent bond, bond, it looks more like a sideways bowling pin, and depending on what the differences are between the electronegativity values of the elements that are forming that bond, you will see it become either a wider bowling ball at the at bottom or a um, more evenly distributed um, bowling ball. Um, and that's going to have to do with where the electrons are more likely to be found in that bond. And then with an ionic bond, we see the actual physical separation. Um, to take a look at this a little bit more in terms of the electronegativity values, we take the difference between the two atoms forming the bond. When the electronegativity value is very, very small, we tend to see a nonpolar covalent bond form. When we have a bond formed between nonmetals or possibly a metalloid and a nonmetal that have a, a slight difference in electronegativities, um, we say a polar covalent bond form where the fluorine side of the molecule is holding on to the electrons a little bit more tightly than hydrogen. And then with the ionic bond, we see that the electronegativity difference has increased rapidly. Um, and we see the physical separation because of the electron transfer from the lithium ion to the fluorine ion. So electronegativity is just basically when an atom would like to grab on to another pair of electrons. And the larger the difference between the electronegativity values of those two atoms, the more ionic your bond will be. Fluorine is our most electronegative element. It is assigned an electronegativity value on the Pauline scale of 4. Um, and so whenever fluorine is involved with a bond with something pretty much other than itself, it's going to hold on to the electrons more tightly than anything else. Noble gases are not assigned electronegativity values as they do not have any desire to form a bond. So here's a chart of electronegativity values that I got from your book. Um, and again, your very um, electronegative elements tend to be found closest to fluorine, and your very non-electronegative elements tend to be found closer to francium. Um, so the nonmetals would like to gain electron pairs, with the exception of our noble gases, which we don't see listed, and our metals have no interest or very, very little interest in gaining electron pairs. So we're going to take a look at these elements and rank them in order of increasing electronegativity, similar to the trends we've done previously. The one with the smallest electronegativity will be the one closest to francium. The one with the greatest will be the one closest to chlorine, excluding your noble gases. So in letter A, if we take a look at sodium, potassium, and rubidium, we would see that those follow down group 1 in order. So the one closest to francium would be rubidium, and then our, the one furthest away would be sodium, and potassium would fall in between. So our order would go from Rb to K to Na. With sulfur, oxygen, and fluorine, we're involving two periods as well as two groups. We have oxygen and sulfur that are in group 16. Fluorine, that is in group 17. Fluorine is our most electronegative element, so it'll be on the very right-hand side. And the one that's furthest away from fluorine would be sulfur, leaving oxygen in between. I would pause now if you still need to write down any information. Our next question asks us to take a look at which of these bonds will be more polar, BF or BCL. Um, boron's electronegativity value will be the same in both bonds, but fluorine's is going to be slightly higher than chlorine's. Fluorine has an electronegativity value of 4, with chlorine have a difference of 3.5. And so when we take the difference between fluorine and boron versus chlorine and boron, we'll see that that one will yield a higher um, electronegativity difference, which means BF will be the more polar bond. In terms of the negative and positive poles in this molecule, 
we would see the negative charge, the partial negative, be on fluorine, whereas boron would have a more positive charge. So we would see an arrow being drawn from boron to fluorine, showing the more um, electronegative end of the molecule on the fluorine side. Again, I would pause now if you still need to write more down. There's three characteristics of bonds that play a role in terms of the energies that are needed to break the bonds, as well as the energies that are involved in forming the bonds. Um, it also has to do with how far the atoms are apart from one another. Um, and they are the order. We've actually talked about this a little bit before. Um, single bonds are assigned an order of one because they have one bonding electron pair. Double bonds are assigned an order of two, and triple bonds are assigned an order of three. When you have a double bond that is being shared um, via a resonance structure between atoms, then if it's between two atoms, it would cause a double bond to count as a 1.5 bond. If it was being shared between three atoms, it would count as 1.33, one and a third. The length of uh, bonds between an atom are going to be smaller the more electron pairs that you have connecting the two atoms together. So the single bond will be the largest of the bonds that only shares one pair, whereas a triple bond will be the shortest. Um, and because there's three electron pairs with that triple bond, we actually see that it is a stronger bond because it's harder to separate three electron pairs than it is to separate one. Um, in terms of how strong the bonds are, we can use their dissociation energy, the separation into the individual atoms. Um, and in order to break any sort of bond, so in order to turn your reactants into products, you're going to need energy to be inputted to force that uh, electron pair to separate. Um, and so that is an endothermic change. Here, um, this is table 8 and 9 in your textbook. Um, we can see that these are single bonds all up here. And then down here in this bottom section, we see the multiple bonds. And if you look, carbon and oxygen, the triple bond formed between them, requires 1,046 kilojoules per mole of energy in order to be broken. Um, but it would also produce 1,046 kilojoules per mole of energy if that bond is formed. And so this is another way for us to determine the energy of a reaction. We've already learned how to do it by using the formation enthalpies of our elements and our compounds. Um, this will allow us to take a look at them just based on the types of bonds that are formed between the atoms making up those molecules. You're going to have one question on your homework which is going to ask you to compare the um, delta H for the reaction by calculating it using bond energies um, um, as well as the um, heats of formation that are found in the back of your book. And you should get pretty similar answers. So, as I said before, to break a bond, you need to add energy, so that's going to be an endothermic change. And to form bonds, you're going to release energy. Since you break bonds on the reactant side and you form them on the product side, as opposed to what we've done before where it's always been final minus initial, this type of energy change is going to involve taking the initial values and subtracting away from that um, the um, product's values so that you have the positive portion first and the negative portion at second, so that we see what the net difference is between the two. So you're going to need to use the table that I talked about previously to do calculations with this section, um, but in order to figure out which components of that table you need, you're going to have to be able to draw these structures. So we see we have methanol CH3OH, and we have carbon monoxide, C triple bonded O, and then we see that this has formed CH3COOH, um, that would be methanoic acid. And so in order to form, um, figure out what the delta H would be based on the bond association enthalpies, we would see that the CH3 has three carbon-hydrogen bonds. Each of the hydrogens is attached to the carbon. A single CO bond and we would see that it also has an OH bond. I think I have a drawing tool, so we're going to see how this works. So, if you're, so how I'm getting these bonds is that I have carbon with four valence electrons. 
each of those valence electrons will be sharing a pair of electrons with the hydrogen's electrons. And then we'll have a single bonded oxygen over here next to carbon. And then we'll have a single bonded OH. And then there would be an electron pair on each side of the oxygen atom. So we see we have the three carbon hydrogen bonds, the one single oxygen bond, and the one O double um, hydrogen bond. We see with um, carbon monoxide we have a triple bond. So that's all that's going to be shown. And then for our CH3COOH, again we've got the carbon on the side with the three hydrogens. A single bonded carbon to that carbon. And then we're also going to have an OH bond like we did on the reactant side. And then the carbon that is attached to both oxygen and carbon will also be double bonded to the second oxygen atom. So this acid will have three carbon-hydrogen bonds as we saw over here with methanol. It'll have a single carbon-carbon bond, a single CO bond, a single OH bond, and a single C double bonded O. So when all that is recorded, we will have the three CH bonds, the CC, the CO, the OH, and the C double bonded O. When you see the same types of bonds on both sides of the equation, you can cancel them out because you're going to both need to break that bond as well as reform it, so the energy difference will be this um, zero. So the carbon and hydrogens are going to cancel each other out, as will the carbon and oxygen, as will the OH. So the net difference that is actually occurring is that we are breaking a triple bonded CO, we're forming a CC bond that's a single bond, and a C double bonded O. So if we go to that chart, we're going to see that the energy needed to break that C triple bond O is 1,046 kilojoules per mole. I have the one mole here because I'm breaking one mole of carbon monoxide up. I'm going to take away from that one mole of the C single bond dissociation energy, which will be 346 kilojoules per mole, as well as one mole of the 745 kilojoules per mole of energy for the C double bonded O. And so the net difference between this gives me a value of negative 45 kilojoules. So it it, this reaction is slightly exothermic. You wouldn't expect it to be really exothermic since we're breaking a triple bond, which is going to require a fairly significant input of energy. But by forming that double bond, we're able to um, release um, some of that energy that was absorbed and end up with an exothermic change. And that is the end of this presentation. Sorry it took a little while to get those pictures drawn. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me in class.